ready? Genuinely, are you ready? Do you know, as I was just worshipping and singing here with you guys, I had this picture. There's a story in the Bible where some friends get together and to get their friend who needed to, see, needed to be in the presence of Jesus, they broke a ceiling. I believe today that there is a ceiling over you that is going to break as you come into the presence of God in Jesus' name. And if you want that for yourself, if you want to be able to look up and whatever is there now to see the floor of heaven, I want you to ready your heart. I want you to come with a teachable spirit. And so, Father, for every single person under the sound of my voice, I pray that my words would be your words. I pray, Lord, that we'd be so sensitive to your presence. Would you remove all that holds us back and hinders us from experiencing the fullness of who you are and the freedom that you died for? In Jesus' name, amen. You can take your seats. Oh, guys. <laughs> uh, wow. Do you know, I absolutely love the series that we're in. We're sort of in the midst, we've just begun a series where we're looking at our values, our values here at Way. And what's important to say, and I'm sort of doing the second part, Rach, um, one of our associate leaders, started it last week. I should probably introduce myself. I feel like it's been a while since I've been here. So my name's Siobhan. Um, I'm one of the associate leaders here. And it is my great privilege and joy to share with you what God has just been stirring in my heart. And as we've been looking at values, it's important for you to know these values, like Rach said last week, give me a wave if you were here last week. Brilliant, a good number of you. I, if you haven't heard last week's message, please do so. You can catch up on our podcast or on YouTube or in various forums, because I believe today is almost part two of that. So I honestly, I speak this message with the understanding of what's gone before, and I see that as a bit of a springboard for today. But these values are not just a good idea. They're not just because we as way want to make a different way. No, we want to do things the Jesus way. And so we've been praying, we've been looking at scripture, and we've asked God for the fingerprint he has on this church community. What is he... What, sort of values from scripture, does he want us to put a spotlight on so we can outlive them and flesh them out in this community to reach the people of, that are in our community for him? And so they're not a good idea, they're God-inspired, which means they are good. <laughs> so last week we, we looked at identity, and identity in Christ becoming above everything, above the influence of culture. Now, a value is something you believe. A value literally shapes your behavior. It shapes what you'll allow. It shapes what you'll create. It also shapes what you won't allow. It shapes what you'll say and what you don't say. Our values fleshed out become the culture of our lives. What are you known for? Genuinely, what are you known for? If someone was to introduce you to somebody that didn't know you, they might say, here is Siobhan, she... I wonder what the finishing of that sentence would be. What are you known for? Because often what you are known for is a good indicator of what you truly value. Not what you say you value, but what you truly value. What is outworked in your behavior, in the tangible and the intangible. Here at Way, we are spending this time to just dig deep into these values because we want to live these values, we want to lead to these values, so that they become the intangible and tangible culture that people bump into, that what we're known for. I don't know about you, but I'm prepared to give my life for that. I'm prepared to give my life for that, that we would be known as a community, as a follower, followers of Jesus, that made sure that our identity in Christ was above anything. That was our highest 
form of identity, that we are children of the living God. And today I want to look at the value of growing people above pursuing program. Now, I'm going to spend the majority of the time I have this morning about looking at what does it mean to grow people. But I want to spend just a few minutes of saying what it's not. Because I, we found it quite helpful to kind of put a context against it. So if we say we value this above this, it puts a little bit of texture to the value that we're trying to convey. And so we value growing people above pursuing program. Pursuing program, let me talk to you what this is not. Growing people is not making the vehicle the goal. Okay? Growing people is not making the vehicle the goal. Here at Way, we have loads of vehicles, discipleship vehicles, that are designed to help you get closer and closer for all people to find their way to God. We have vehicles that have been designed to help you draw you closer to God. But the goal is not the vehicle. So we're not pursuing more and more vehicles. Because what happens in that vehicle is way more important than the vehicle itself. The vehicle is not the goal. When you go into different church communities, charities, businesses, councils, schools, all kinds of platforms, you see the prevailing culture of, if I put this program on, I can tick the box. If I put this program on, then hopefully that will outwork the thing that I say I value. Well, people are as people do. So just because you have a program does not mean you have achieved the value that you have set out to achieve. So we have community groups. But you can meet in a community, and unless you gather there in his name, and unless you're seeking to follow him closely, unless you're seeking to be changed by the truth and to do the things that Jesus did because he did them and motivated by his love, that vehicle will just be a community group, and we can have hundreds of them. But they're not going to help people grow closer to God. And so we're not about making the vehicle the goal. Just because we have a grocery that seeks to help people who are in financial need does not mean we're reaching people unless we're giving them more than food. Unless when we meet them, we give them the truth of the good news of who Jesus is. Because I know you need to be fed, but you need way more than bread. You need the bread of life. And so we're about growing, pe we're about growing people, not just pursuing program and putting them on so we all feel good about ourselves because we have all these different groups that say they're doing something, but is it actually the behavior and the culture that you bump into? Because a coffee shop is way more than a coffee shop. When, when you're pouring a drink, you're asking, what does good news look like to you today? Can I offer you more than a drink? Can I pray with you? We've had guests from Postcode give stories of where they've asked the team to pray. We've as a staff prayed. We put it on the prayer team. And they've come to pass. People have seen healing. They've seen miracles. Why? Because it wasn't about the program. It's not about the quantity over quality. It's not we're not just pursuing programs and, wow, we've got this great variety. It is about the quality of discipleship, the quality of learning to be more like Jesus in these forums that's above anything else. So that's what it's not. Are you happy to hear that? Why don't we just focus on what it is, okay? So growing people. <laughs> Can I just have a moment of real, real honesty with you, okay? Just let me back. I'm, just, I'm going to be so honest with you. Right, we, growing people. I realized that I have given my life probably for the last 17 years in the pursuit of being a person who grows 
and a person who grows others. And I realized there was a marked shift in my life where I had a revelation of God, where the things that were once important actually took second place, and he became so central. And I started to ask him what the call of my life was. But as someone who has pursued and God and really sought to be a person who grows and who grows others, guys, it's not easy. <laughs> that is not the easy way. Just think about asking your five, a five-year-old child, whether they belong to you or not, <laughs> and ask them to fill your dishwasher. Hello, everyone went, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to ask them to do that. Well, sometimes that's how life feels when you are in the pursuit of growing yourself and growing others. It's easier to do yourself. <laughs> it's just easier. Is it better? No. Is it easier at times? It's easier instantly, but it's harder long term. So you'll get the instant relief of at least it's done, but you have the longer term of going, you have not grown yourself and you've not grown anybody else. And when you don't do it, it doesn't get done. You make it harder for everyone in the long term. And so we have been committed as a community, as followers of Jesus, to be people who grow and people who grow others. How committed are you to grow personally? You know, I, was, I feel like this is confession time. Wow. I just feel like, oh, be careful <laughs> what I share today. But I'm doing a Bible study in the year. And guys, I'm way behind. Okay, I'm nearly the whole year behind. Okay, I'm about 60 days behind. And I'm not even sure there's been 60 days that I've been following it. So I'm behind. Why? Because I've not been doing the consistent thing. The, because it's not a lot. I timed it. It's about five, ten minutes to do the Bible study. Why can't I do that consistent, small thing well? Because if I did it, it would produce. And so that's just my own like little public confession there. Wow. But I was listening. <laughs> that's not the story. <laughs> I was listening to it on 1.2, right? So it's a little bit faster than one, but it's not too fast that I can't actually listen to it. And as I was listening to it, this verse came up in John 3, 30, that says, he must increase and I must decrease. And I knew that scripture, but I'd never actually seen it or read it in context before. And so I went home and I started to read it a little more. Now, the reason that scripture made me laugh is because probably about 10, maybe 11 something years ago, we had a art student here, a part of way. And she was moving on, I think she was going to Scotland somewhere, and she got pieces of wood and designed pretty sort of um, verses. She put verses and painted verses on these pieces of wood. And she gave them to every one of the staff. Give me a wave if you were part of that and you got a, a piece of wood. Okay, Rachel's got her hand up. There's been a couple of us who got these great pieces of wood that were beautiful um, with these scriptures painted on them. Now, comparison is the thief of joy, by the way. That is a scripture. You can have that. So, but I got my piece of wood, and on there it said, he must become greater and you must become less. And I remember thinking... I don't know, like, okay, that's good, it's the Bible, I can't, like, disagree with it, but why did you give me this one? So, like, I looked at, like, not be funny, I saw Ben and Rachel, and I'm like, wow, like, this is like, oh, you know, you're going to do mighty things, and mine was like, you must become less. I'm thinking, is she saying something about my loudness? Is she saying something about my muchness of personality? I was just thinking, like, okay, thanks, but like, oh, thanks, it does allude to, and because she took so much time to make it, and it was scripture, I hung it up on the wall, so it's been there, but you know what, as the years have gone on, I realized the truth in that statement, and what does it mean to grow in God? We serve an upside-down kid. If you are a child of God, 
that means you are a citizen of heaven. And if you are a citizen of heaven, that means the economy of heaven applies to you. And often we say this phrase of the kingdom of heaven is like, it has like an upside down economy because it doesn't make sense sometimes. Because there's scripture that says the more you give, the more you have. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. Now that doesn't make sense on, in our earthly understanding because one minus one is less. <laughs> I used to be a primary school teacher, guys. I can tell you that's true. But in the economy of heaven, it's an upside down economy. And so there's some things you have to unlearn when it comes to your earthly understanding so that you can gain heavenly insight. And as a citizen of heaven, when I become less and he becomes more, let me tell you, that is how I grow and become spiritually more mature. And so that little bit of scripture that was on that gift that I was given set me on a path to go, Lord, what does it mean for me to be less, for me to die to myself so that I can truly live? What does that mean? I'm going to pick up the book of John. So if you look in your Bibles, you'll find there's like a, it's like a library, your Bible, and there's lots of little books in there. And so there's the book of John. Now, I was speaking to Rachel, um, as one of our associate leaders, about, we were just talking about how much we love John, okay? We were saying, one of the wonderful things about John, oh, I nearly went into a Win Winnie the Pooh song, one of the wonderful things about John, what, never mind, that's how my mind works, guys. What a wonderful thing about John is that he knew who he was in Christ. He knew he had his identity set in Christ. He knew his identity in Jesus, and he knew his calling. So if you look at the book of John 1, John 1 is all about identity and calling. And so it sets out John's identity. John's identity is that he was a witness. He was a man sent by God to be a witness. That was his identity. His calling was so that he needed to be a witness to the light so that all might believe. That's why very often if you're new to faith and you're starting a relationship with Jesus, we encourage you to read the book of John because the book of John is written so that you might believe. The book of John is written with evidence that if you reflected on that evidence, you might believe. So John 1 is all about identity and calling. It's very clear about the identity of Jesus. It says that Jesus, he is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's stating very clearly his divine authority. And then he tells you Jesus' purpose, to take away the sin of the world. John 2 starts looking at the relationship that Jesus has with his church. I find it amazing that Jesus starts his ministry, he starts his ministry at a wedding. Do you not find that amazing? Where often Jesus is called the bridegroom and the church is called his bride. And his very first miracle happens at a wedding. And he turns water into wine. And the master of ceremony calls the bridegroom and says, you have saved the good wine for now. And Jesus is there. I just, I love the fact that he's highlighting right at the beginning, this is how I mean to go on. I have come for the one, I, I, the, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son that you may have eternal life. And John 3 now, just because time is escaping me, I'm going to ask you to read John 3 in your own time. I was going to read it with you today, but John 3, verse 22, just make a note, John 3, verse 22 to 36. I want you to read that, but I want you to read it, one, in the ESV, which is the, um, one of the um, sort of translations of the Bible, and I also want you to read it in the message, because in the message, it's funny, 
So we've got John sort of stating who he is. He's the one who's pointing to Jesus. And he makes clear who Jesus is. And then we have Jesus' ministry in John 2, starting at, at the uh, wedding. And then in John 3, what happens is Jesus is baptized by John. And what you have to understand at that time, John was doing all the baptisms, okay? And so Jesus announces, I'm sorry, John announces Jesus and says, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of God. And so he baptizes Jesus. What's interesting is a little bit later, John's disciples, the people who were following John, come and say to John, Rabbi, which means teacher, you know that one you baptized yesterday, the one you witnessed for? Well, he's baptizing other people over there, and everyone's going to them now instead of us. In fact, in the message it says, they're in competition with us. How can Jesus be in competition when the whole point of baptism is to point us to a life that's lived out in Jesus? Let me tell you, and then John says, right, the one who comes from heaven speaks the words of heaven. The one who comes from heaven is head and shoulders above the rest. He's the bridegroom and I'm the best man. Like, he says, it's my joy, and he says in the message, to slip to the sidelines and watch the bridegroom and to be his best man, to grow and to mature as believers. You're going to have to be prepared for it not to be about your wedding, for you not to be the center stage. You're not the hero of your story. You have to die to yourself and go, I get to be the best man. I get to be the bridesmaid. I get to be so close that I can hear his voice, that I can rejoice, that I can praise him because it's about him. Here we have Jesus and with the bride who is the church and when the church makes it about the groom, you can't go far wrong. It's not about the vehicle. It's about us growing and dying to self to say, it's about your way. It's about your way and not mine. It's about your thoughts being higher than mine. And this is, you can take my table, thanks. We're gonna pray and finish here. And I'm gonna read to you in Ephesians 4, 15. says this, Ephesians 4, 15 to 16, instead, we will speak the truth in love. What's the truth? That he's the son of God, that he's come so that you may not perish, but we can all experience life, eternal life and life to the full. That's the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of this body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. How do you grow? You adopt a teachable spirit that says, I wanna be more like him. How do you grow that? I wanna say I've noticed that when people are able to reflect, when they're able to take heaven's perspective and see that lens, their own life through that lens, they start to see where the wisdom of God needs to be applied, where they need to, where they're once stuck in their own ways and their own thinking. But with heaven's perspective, his thoughts and his ways, I get to mature and be, die to self and adopt more of his ways, more of his character, more of his wisdom, more of him, more of him and less of me. And we get to help each other do that. And when we help each other grow in the likeness of God, what happens is this body 
often the church is referred to, the a company of believers is referred to the body. Jesus is the head. And we get to do our own part. We're not in competition with each other. It's ridiculous to think that an arm could be competitive against the hand that's part of the same body. We need to be unified because we've all been baptized by one Spirit, by one Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. And so how do we grow? I think you were looking for maybe point one, and there are points, there are things that can help us. I believe adopting heaven's perspective, taking things at a fresh look are things that can help you grow. Get a fellow believer, get someone who's walked with Jesus for a long time to sit with you and go, help me to see this from heaven's perspective. Taking things at a fresh glance, seeing people in, with fresh eyes. Sometimes we're stuck in seeing people from the, like as they were, and we're not allowing them to heal. We're not allowing them to move on. They've moved on, but you're still seeing them through all. This is how we help people grow. We help them grow by seeing them as God sees them. We must become less, and He must become more. His vision needs to become our vision. His thoughts need to become our thoughts. And I, I want to say to you, endurance, persistence. Rach, I've not read this book, but I love the title, guys. And I'm hopefully going to read the book. I'm going to see if there's an audio. But there's, there's a book called The Long Obedience in the Same Direction. By, it's by Eugene Peterson, I think. Sometimes we're just, oh, this is not working. I'll try something new. No, you know what? The, the journey of someone who follows Jesus, it's the long obedience in the same direction. And what's the direction? To become more and more like Him. Some of you are giving up on things because they're not giving you the instant gratification that you want. Well, I'm sorry <laughs> that following Jesus means that you adopt a life that says, I increasingly become more like Him. And so I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to pray. We're going to pray that we collectively, individually become more like Him. I want to pray two very specific prayers. If you are here and you're saying, yes, I want, to be, I want to be someone who witnesses to you right now. I want to be someone who tells you what I know, what I've seen, what I've experienced. I've seen Jesus take my life that was given to him in lots of broken pieces. And he started to breathe life. He started to bring, breathe hope where there was no hope. He started to breathe joy. He started to breathe peace. He started to breathe wisdom. He started to strengthen what was weak. He built me up. He brought light to the dark places of my life. He brought green pastures to grass and fields that were dry. I don't know where you need the light of God, but if you're here and you're saying that Jesus came so that you would not perish, He came to take away your sin, He came to bring your life and life to the full. If that's you and you want to start this journey, sometimes we say, I can't say yes to Jesus because I, I'm not, I don't have it all together. Well, that's not how growing works. You don't grow by being at the end. You grow little by little. And sometimes those seeds stay under the ground and it doesn't look like you're growing, but you're growing little by little. And if that's you right now, if you want to say, you know what, Lord, I'm gonna, would you meet me where I am? Would you take away the sin and my brokenness? And would you restore and heal? Would you bring joy? Would you strengthen? Would you take the ceiling off my life so I can stretch and grow into all that you've called me to be? 
If you want to come into that relationship with your heavenly Father, if you want to be able to walk and know that you are a child of God, you are that already. It's about you coming to understanding about your identity. If that's you right now and you want to follow Jesus and be changed by him and start to do the things that he did, would you just raise your hand right now? You're not going to be on your own because we're just going to, the other's going to come with you. He sees your hand. He sees your hand. He knows your heart. Now's the time to be courageous. A courageous faith to say, I'm not going to have the same. I'm going to be changed from the inside out. I'm going to look like my heavenly father every day more and more. He sees your hand and he knows your heart. And I want you to respond to God. I want you to put your hand up if there is something that you're stuck in. Somewhere where you're stuck and you're, Lord, I want to grow past this. Lord, I, I want to see breakthrough. I want to see that I get to flourish. Lord, I want to stretch out my branches. I want to produce the fruit of you, Lord. I want to become more and more like you. But there, I'm stuck in some of my old ways. I'm stuck in some of my old thinking. Lord, would you meet me where I am now and help me to bear your image more sharply with more clarity. Just raise your hand. Lord, I just pray for all those with their hands raised that you would meet them where they are. Ah, Lord, I, I water their prayer. Lord, I water their prayer right now. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you will prune what is hindering growth and that you would feed what needs to be encouraged to grow. Lord, I just pray that you would meet these people where they are and where they are stuck and need a ceiling broken off them. Lord, I pray right now that you would, they would encounter you in such a powerful way. Help us all, Lord, to be less so that you can be greater. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. Thank you.